couple of years ago, there was a video that circulated the internet that featured a 12-year-old Minnesota boy by the name of Jonathan Jones, who happened to have been born with a severe version of color blindness. The principal at his school, by the name of Scott Hansen, also happened to have been colorblind, and every year, Principal Hansen was invited to go and speak to the middle school science class during the time when they were studying genetics. In other words, those traits that are handed down and inherited one from another, colorblindness, which happens to be one of them. Perhaps there's somebody here today who knows that all too well. So Principal Hansen was invited to come to this middle school class and speak about his affliction, but here's what you need to know prior to that. Two years before this took place, Principal Hansen had been given by his family a gift that foundationally changed his world. His family had done some research and they bought a pair of glasses that had special optical filters in them that enabled him to be able to see color in a way that he'd never seen it before. So moving of an experience was this for Principal Hansen that he decided that someday he was going to pay it forward. So. Principal Hansen is going to class knowing that young Jonathan Jones suffers from the same kind of severe color blindness that he did, and so he brought with him a gift. Now, it's a middle school classroom a couple years ago, and so all the middle school kids had cell phones with them. One of the students took out the cell phone and videoed as young Jonathan Jones was given this gift. Jonathan opens the package, pulls out a pair of glasses with these special optical filters in them, puts them on his face, and immediately he is overwhelmed with joy. Tears start flowing down his face as he is able to differentiate colors that he's never been able to see before. And of course, this circulates the internet and becomes viral because it's such a moving experience. Can you imagine being completely colorblind and then enabled to see color and all of its vibrance, the beauty of God's creation with new and fresh eyes? What an incredible experience that would be. Well, as incredible of an experience as that was, and with the joy that we share with young Jonathan Jones as he put on those glasses, it's even more amazing, the story of a person that we're going to read about today in John's Gospel. There was a man who Jesus encountered who had been born completely blind. Not only could he not differentiate colors, he couldn't see light at all. His world was sheer darkness. And Jesus encounters this man and brings sight to his blindness. Now, although we look at Jonathan Jones' story and we're overwhelmed with joy just as we see his reaction and the tears that flow down his face, surprisingly, when this man from the scriptures is healed, his community doesn't respond but with the same kind of joy. We're going to read about that in just a moment. We're going to be looking at John chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. Then I'm going to explain what happens in between. And we're going to close with John 9, 35 through 38. Really, all of chapter 9 is an extended narrative about this healing of a blind man and how it unfolds. But we don't have time to read all of it. So we're going to read a couple snippets. So first, you're going to hear from chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. Then I'll talk for quite a while. And I promise we will get to 35 through 38 at some point. Hear now the word of the Lord. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned that this man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like the guy. But he himself insisted, 
I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they call Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. John 9 is one of the most fascinatingly deep and rich chapters in all of the gospel of John. Interestingly, this is the only passage in John's gospel where somebody is said to have been afflicted by a congenital disease and is subsequently healed. In other words, it's the only time Jesus healed anybody who had something that happened at birth that they were healed from. Here's how it happened. Jesus, in the preceding chapters, chapters 7 and 8, happened to be in the temple in Jerusalem where he celebrated the festival of the tabernacles. This was one of the three major Jewish pilgrimage feasts for which people would travel from all over the surrounding regions to go into Jerusalem, and Jesus was celebrating tabernacles there. Interestingly, light happened to be one of the central images of this festival. Every day of the seven days of the feast, that people would light four giant torches in the courtyard of the temple. And these torches were to symbolize God's presence among his people. Now, you remember the story of the Exodus, when the Israelites are set free from slavery into Egypt, from Egypt into the wilderness, and God led them by a pillar of fire by day and a pillar of cloud by night? The lighting of these torches was intended to symbolize that power and that presence of God among the people during the Feast of Tabernacles. So right in the midst of the temple, in the preceding chapters, Jesus declares, I am, one of the six I am statements found in the Gospel of John through which Jesus was communicating who he was, tying into God's name revealed to Moses at the burning bush. Jesus said, I am the light of of the world. Well, this caused a little bit of a scuffle in the temple because Jesus was declaring in this moment that not only was he God's physical presence among his people, but also that he was the one through whom light had been called from darkness into being. Jesus made this claim and it caused a stir and so he was just departing the temple and as he went along, he came across this man who had been born blind. Notice that Jesus saw the man. might go without stating, but the man didn't see Jesus. Jesus saw the man, and Jesus initiated this whole interaction. While the man was lost in darkness, not being able to see anything, Jesus went to him. Some of the people that Jesus healed throughout the scriptures call out to Jesus, saying, Jesus, son of man, son of David, come and heal me. This man doesn't make any appeal to Jesus. Jesus initiates the whole interaction. Now, the disciples were apparently familiar with this guy, or at least they knew him well enough to know the history of his blindness, that he had been blind since birth. So the 12 used this as an opportunity to initiate a question of Jesus that circled around a contemporary debate that took place in the ancient world. The question that they asked orbited around this question. Rabbi, who sinned? In other words, the disciples were eager to connect the man's suffering with sin. Many people in the ancient world assumed that if somebody was suffering, it had to be because of something that somebody did. Sin and suffering were intricately connected. And so the disciples presumed if this man has been suffering from this affliction since birth, clearly he must have done something to have deserved it, right? There's something distinctly human, by the way, about the desire to connect sin with suffering, wrongdoing with consequences. We long to make that connection, and and you know what? We're not immune to it today, and I'll prove it to you. You ever been driving down the highway, say Highway 75, some maniac blows past you at uh, 15 to 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, not in the left lane, but in the right lane, and just then, the both of you pass a Florida Highway patrolman There's a part of you that wants to blurt out, yes, get him, (laughs) right? Despite the fact that you also were going seven to eight miles an hour over the speed limit, right? This is just human nature, the longing to connect wrongdoing with consequences. And truth be told, there are times when our wrongdoing, our sin, leads to natural consequences, and those consequences lead to suffering, But to connect suffering that we're experiencing necessarily to a particular sin, that's something different entirely. But there's this longing in us 
for justice. And that longing says that good things ought to happen to good people, right? And bad things, well, that ought to happen to bad people. And maybe we wouldn't say it that explicitly, but at least we would say it seems a little bit more unfair or unjust if bad things happen to good people or good things seemingly happen to bad people. But nonetheless, it's a general biblical principle that good things tend to come to people who make good choices and bad things tend to come to bad people that make bad choices, right? I mean, we see it all the way back in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, there was no suffering at all in paradise, just joy and peace. And then Adam and Eve take of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and when they sink their teeth into it, suffering is birthed into the world, is it not? And it's not just the story of the origin of our humanity, it's also it's the story of the covenants from the Old Testament. And the covenants that, uh, for example, God made through Moses with the Israelites, there were blessings set forth for obedience to the covenant. If you obey the covenant, things were going to go well for you. And there were curses set forth for disobedience. If you don't obey the covenant, then the peoples around you are going to take you over and kick you out of the promised land. So it appears in the scriptures that there's a general connection between sin and suffering. And also, the Bible makes it fairly clear it's not a one-for-one connection. But rather, there are times where the wicked persist in their evil schemes seemingly unscathed, and there are times when the innocent suffer. If you look to the book of Psalms, Psalm 94, the psalmist laments, how long, O Lord, will the wicked be jubilant, the psalm says. Or it's like it says in Psalm 73, the psalmist also laments, he says, I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. And so it seems that there are times when when bad people seem to get away with their evil schemes, parenthetically, at least for a time. And there are times throughout the biblical narrative where the innocent, like the story of Job, a righteous man who had done nothing wrong in the eyes of God, suffer or maybe more emphatically, when Jesus, the one in whom there was no deceit and no sin, suffered and died for us. So while there's a general biblical principle that good things tend to come to people who make good choices and bad things can tend to befall the wicked, it's not a one-for-one connection. And any time we try to get it in the other order, sin tends to lead to consequences which leads to suffering. Anytime we get it in the wrong order where we look at somebody who's suffering and say, boy, it must have been something that they did, we are getting it completely wrong. So the disciples come to Jesus seeing this man who's been born blind and they ask him the question, Master, Who sinned that this guy's been born blind? And Jesus doesn't bite. He doesn't make the connection. He doesn't connect the circuit between sin and suffering. He doesn't disavow the general connection between sin and suffering, but he completely disavows the universalizing of it. And he replies, this didn't happen to this guy because he deserved it. This didn't happen because his parents did something wrong. This happened so that the glory of God might be revealed in him. Verse 3. Neither this man sinned nor his parents, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Here's the astonishing good news and the truth of this passage. God can take whatever darkness we are in and his infinite sovereignty, whether it's disappointment or regret or despair or loneliness or sorrow or sighing or pain, God can take whatever darkness we find ourselves in and he can shine his light right into the midst of it. This man was lost in darkness, unable to do anything for himself. Jesus saw him, approached him, and brought him from light, from darkness into the light. The implications of this are astonishing. This means that whatever darkness you're going through today, whatever it was that popped into your mind when I talked about God's uh, leading us from darkness into light, whatever that moment is for you and that hardship or ailment is for you, it means that it's not purposeless or meaningless. It means that God can take even this and he would delight in nothing more than bringing you from darkness out into the light. This is astonishing. But the story continues. A miracle like this was going to be noticed by some folks 
because it was thought during the time period that the most difficult of all miracles was to heal a congenital one, one that existed from the time that somebody was born. That was the most difficult, hard miracle to perform, and yet this is the one that Jesus chooses to do. And what's more, it was even more difficult not only to heal somebody who was afflicted from birth, but also to do so when you weren't even in the presence of the person when they were said to be healed. And Jesus, remember, sent the man away. And then he was healed when they're no longer together. And so the neighbors who had seen this man begging are astonished by the fact that this took place. And they approach him and they say, how is it that this happened to you? And the man reports, remember, this this is actually kind of a funny response. So when they ask who did this for him, he says, not Jesus did this. He says, the man they call Jesus did this. In other words, at this point in chapter 9, he has still never seen Jesus. Jesus put the mud on his eyes, sent him down to the pool of Siloam. He is washed, and then he's healed. And so the only way he knows who has done this is because somebody has said Jesus' name. So he says, the man they called Jesus did this healing. Well, this healing was so miraculous that it undoubtedly made it its way up the ranks, and the Pharisees heard about it. The Pharisees were supposed to be the religious leaders who really knew God and knew God well. But ironically, in John's gospel, they end up being somewhat the blind leading the blind. I mean, the Pharisees, as we're going to hear in a song sung after this, the Pharisees just couldn't understand who Jesus was. Here's what you need to know. We didn't read this part, but a couple of verses after we stopped reading, we discover that this blind man was actually healed on the Sabbath. (gasps) That was a big deal. You weren't allowed to heal people on the Sabbath. You weren't allowed to do any work on the Sabbath. Well, that's not true. You could do a healing as long as it was a life or death situation. But this clearly wasn't a life or death situation. This man had been afflicted since birth. And so the Pharisees hear that Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath, and they are scandalized by it. The irony is that the blind are somewhat leading the blind in in this passage. Truth be told, this is a broader theme in John's gospel. Light and darkness, sight and blindness. Those who we think should have sight end up being blind, and those who we think are blind end up seeing. This is the irony that is unfolding throughout the gospel, and we see it as early as in chapter one. In the prologue to the gospel, the evangelist tells us that light was coming into the darkness, and the darkness could not overcome it. A couple of chapters later, this light into darkness motif continues when a a man, a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus, comes to Jesus under the cover of darkness, which he probably did because he didn't want his other religious brothers and sisters to see him doing this because he knew that they'd be mad at him. So he goes to Jesus under the cover of darkness for all sorts of practical purposes, but John's probably also telling us that at this point, he still can't see. He still can't understand exactly who Jesus is. And then in the preceding chapter, it all comes to a head. Jesus, in the middle of the the Feast of Tabernacles, in the middle of the temple, declares, I am the light of the world. Those who walk walk with me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And it scandalizes the Pharisees there as well. This theme is repeating over and over in John's Gospel, such that when the Pharisees hear that Jesus healed a guy in the On the Sabbath, they call the blind man in and they start to interrogate him. And whereas the disciples were more concerned about whether or not the man had sinned or his parents had sinned, the Pharisees think that it's Jesus who's the sinner. The irony here is that Jesus is the only human being who has never sinned once in his whole life. The scriptures tell us he is the unblemished lamb of God. And the Pharisees are confused thinking that he has sinned. It's like it says in the book of Isaiah, chapter 5. Verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. The Pharisees, who were supposed to be these people of the light, are lost in the darkness. And so they ask of this man, how is it that all of this happened to you from this sinful man, Jesus? And the man replies, I don't know how such a sinner, as you would say, could do such a miraculous healing. Here's all I know. I was blind, and now I see. Well, this doesn't satisfy the Pharisees. So they send the man who's been healed away. They call in his parents, and they say to his parents, hey, 
was your son really born blind? And he says, they say, yes, of course he was. And can he now really see? Yes, of course he can. And then the Pharisees ask, who did this? At this point, the parents know if they say Jesus did it, they're going to be cut off from the religious community. And so they pass the buck. They literally throw their son under the bus. Well, not literally. They throw their son under the bus. And they say, he's of age. Ask him who did it. So the Pharisees send his parents away, and they call the blind man, or the formerly blind man, back in, and they ask him the same line of questioning. And at this point, the man's response is utterly brilliant and thoroughly infuriating for the Pharisees. They say, how is it that it's possible that you're healed? And he replied to them, you know, I've already told you all of this, and you didn't believe me. Why have you called me back in? Do you want to be his followers too? And they get so mad that they bear their cards and tell us exactly what they believed was already at work in the situation. They hurl insults at the man who's been healed. They throw him out and they say, you have been steeped in sin since your birth. How dare you say that to us? And the man, who was formerly on the streets begging just to persist, who was isolated and alone and utter and sheer darkness, finds himself now cut off from his religious community again. And here is how Jesus responds. Chapter 9, verses 38, 35 through 38. Jesus heard that the Pharisees had thrown him out, and when he found out, he found the man and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? the man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking to you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped Jesus. The man had formerly been healed of his physical affliction. And now in this second encounter, he's healed from his spiritual affliction And he's healed as he sets eyes for the first time on the one who he's only heard about so far. And his healing is made complete. On the amount of time that I have left up here, I just want to unpack real quickly three different implications of this passage. And the first is this, that Jesus sees people in their darkness. There are times when the darkness seems so overwhelming around us, we can't see the way forward. It seems to have just swallowed us up whole. And Jesus sees us in our darkness, and we do not walk alone. Imagine how isolating it must have been for the man to sit and beg for his life literally every day in the streets of Jerusalem. It would have been a completely isolating and lonely experience until the day when a man who he couldn't even see came up to him and provided the healing he desperately needed but didn't even ask for. The good news is that Jesus saw him in the midst of his darkness and God sees us in our darkness too. It's like it says in Psalm 139, even the darkness will not be dark to God. The night will shine like day, for darkness is as light to God. No matter how dark it may seem around you, no matter what affliction you're going through, you don't walk alone, but Jesus sees you in the midst of your darkness. Secondly, there's a broader theme that is unfolding through the Gospel of John here, which is that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Our sovereign God is strong enough to bring light into whatever darkness you are facing. And Jesus, by the way, isn't interested in the contemporary debate that was going on of giving condemnation to this man who everybody else seemed to think it was his fault he was blind in the first place. Jesus isn't interested in that at all. Rather, Jesus longs to bring light into the dark places of our lives. And here's the good news. God is sovereign enough that no matter how dark it seems, no matter how alone we may feel, God is strong enough to infuse his light into our dark spaces. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know how hopeless it seems, and I don't know how purposeless it seems, but I do know this, 
that in the midst of your darkness, God has the ability to shine his light in a powerful way. And perhaps finally, from this passage, sometimes the healing we truly need waits until we meet our maker face to face. You know, the blind man initially had his sight restored, but it was a partial healing. It wasn't until he saw Jesus face to face that his spiritual healing was complete. There may be things that you are going through that are going to continue to afflict you, for which you've only received partial healing. When we come to Christ, we receive a spiritual healing, don't we? We, It means that our sins are no longer held against us, that Jesus doesn't long to condemn us, but he's given us the ability to become his children and to be children of the light. But sometimes the afflictions that afflict us don't go away in the short term. They continue on, that is, until we see our maker face to face. So the darkness doesn't completely go away. But it's like it says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. For now we see only a reflection in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now we are known in part. Then I shall be known even as I am fully known. There is a day coming for all of us. And we just heard it sung about. When there will be no more sorrow or sighing or pain, but there will be life everlasting. There will be no more darkness, but there will be only the light of God's radiance. That is the hope that awaits us, but it may have to wait until we see our Lord face to face. Let me close with this. Nicodemus was a man who came to Jesus under the cover of night. He was a Pharisee. He was curious about who Jesus was, and Jesus spent all sorts of time going back and forth, but he leaves sort of not really understanding who Jesus is. That is until Jesus goes to the cross. And who shows up at the cross after Jesus has given his life but the man who was formerly blind, who's now seen his Savior in his full glory? And it's Nicodemus, who's one of the ones who takes Christ's body down from the cross and buries it. I believe that's because Nicodemus went from darkness and was brought into the light. And in that very first interaction, some of the most powerful words of all of the scriptures are recounted. Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And then he goes on in verse 17 to say, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus in this passage shows no interest in condemning the man who was born blind. He saw all the interest in the world in bringing light to his darkness. He saw the man while he was in his darkness, had the light to overcome his darkness, and he introduced himself to him face to face. I want that to be my story. How about you? Would you pray with me? Oh, Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for the light of the world stepped down into darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. Lord, so often in our lives, we don't have eyes to see or ears to hear or minds to understand just exactly who you are. We're completely dependent upon you to open our blind eyes, to restore our sight, to help us see your light in our darkness. We ask, oh Lord, that you'd give us the grace to place our trust and our faith in you and that you'd open our eyes that we might truly see. We thank you, O Lord, for the hope that was given to us by your son, Jesus Christ, and that the grave could not hold him even after he innocently suffered on our behalf. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.
Oh,